All right. Good morning, everyone. It is great to see everybody this morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. It is great to be here to worship God with everybody here at FCS. We are so excited that the AC is back on. Amen. We did not want to run anybody away. So amen, God has provided by making the AC back, turn back on. And we're definitely excited and to have a cool service where we can really focus on God and not on being hot. Amen. And so, you know, we've been going through the book of Hebrews. We've been talking about Jesus. We've been talking about just how Jesus is supreme over everything. And um, just been learning about just how we can really apply that to our lives. And what's great is we're also learning how can we trust God. And we're learning this in a way of getting rid of everything that hinders us and the sin that easily entangles us. And so what we're going to do, we're going to continue with this theme in the book of Joshua. But before we get there, I'm going to share a couple of stories with you. A man spent 28 years in his, of his life in prison. It was not a prison of bars and locks and wardens, but a self-imposed prison of fear. He was a Japanese soldier on the island of Guam during World War II. And when the American forces landed, he fled into the jungle and found a cave in which he hid for 28 years because he was afraid of being captured by the Americans. He learned that the war was over by reading one of the thousands of pamphlets dropped into the jungle, but he was afraid. So for 28 years, he lived in a cave, coming out only at night to look for roaches and rats and frogs and mangoes on which he survived. Finally, some natives found him and convinced him that it would be all right for him to come out of this jungle prison. We might be thinking, what a waste. Imagine spending 28 years of your life in the prison of fear. Yet, there are a lot of people today who are prisoners of fear. We, have, we all have some type of fear in our lives. It might be for some health, it might be financial, it could be this fear of the unknown. We all have some type of fear. But how do we overcome fear? Maybe the better question is, how do you overcome fear? Because fear does many things. It will hold us back. It will even sometimes make us, have us cause to make bad decisions. And it will also maybe just make us cause to do some things that we would normally do. Here's an example. There was a tightrope walker who did incredible aerial feats. All over Paris, he would do tightrope acts at tremendous scary heights. Then he had succeeding acts. He would do it blindfolded. Then he would go across a tightrope blindfolded, pushing a wheelbarrow. An American promoter read about this in the papers and wrote a letter to the tightrope walker saying, tightrope, I don't believe you can do it, but I'm willing to make you an offer. For a very substantial sum of money besides all your transportation fees, I would like to challenge you to do your act over Niagara Falls. Now, tightrope wrote back, sir, although I've never been to America and never seen the falls, I'd love to come. Well, after a lot of promotion and setting the whole thing up, many people came to see the event. Tightrope was to start on the Canadian side and come to the American side. Drums roll and he, ro and he comes across the rope, which is spinning over the treacherous parts of the falls, blindfolded. And he makes it across easily. The crowds go wild and he comes to the promoter and says, well, Mr. Promoter, now do you believe I can do it? Well, of course I do. I mean, I just saw you do it. No, said Tightrope. Do you really believe I can do it? Well, of course I do. You just did it. No, 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 said Tightrope. Do you believe I can do it? Yes, said Mr. Promoter. I believe you can do it. Good, said Tightrope. Now you get in the wheelbarrow. The word believe in Greek means to live by. This is a nice story. It makes you think about, oh, we believe in Christ but are refusing to get in the wheelbarrow. It's important for you and I to get advice about handling fear and the things associated with us in our lives. It's not only important that we get advice, but also get the right advice, because the wrong advice can be just as destructive as getting no advice at all. The best advice comes from God's word. One illustration of fear in God's word is the walls of Jericho. So today we're gonna to learn from Joshua 6, how to overcome our fears by having faith in God and being obedient to his word. Let's pray. 
Lord, thank you for this opportunity, God, to come before you right now. God, I definitely want to send up a, a special prayer for Ashley McDowell and her um, baby, God, who was just born. Uh, we pray for them and the family in the D.C. hospital as the baby needs heart surgery. God, be with them. Uh, be with the doctors as they perform that surgery when they do it. Be with the baby. Be with the family as well, God. Uh, so I pray you just be with them in a special way. Lord, I pray your spirit would just lead us and guide us right now as we get into your word. Um, help us, Lord, to really to see what you have for us in the scriptures that we can apply to our lives. God, I do pray that you remove me, that your Holy Spirit will speak through me, God, and that you will help me to preach the word of what you want me to speak to your people and to my own heart as well. Thank you for this opportunity and time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Turn with me to Joshua chapter 5. And we'll start in verse 13. Now, when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground of reference and asked him, what message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with his king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry, tr carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them, sound a long blast on the trumpets. Have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua said of none, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carrying trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance. March around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets. And the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the people, Do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the people returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marking before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them, and the rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and the gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet, sound, when the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in, and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword everything in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, go into the, priest, or go into the prostitute's house and bring her out, all who belong to her, in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother and brothers, and all who belong to her. 
They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron to the treasure of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn oath. Cursed before the Lord is the man who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, will he lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, will he set up his gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. I have one point for today, and it's also the title of today's lesson. Go and take the city. Go and take the city. And so we started off in Joshua 5, and Joshua has this counter with the, with the commander of the army. And so Joshua's thinking, okay, whose side are you on? And Joshua's like, neither. You know, I'm a commander of the Lord's army. And Joshua's like, you know what, I need to bow before this guy and be humble and listen to what he's saying to me. And so he takes off his sandals, and the place that he's standing is holy. So Joshua submits to God going into, and going to this battle with Jericho. So with Jericho itself, what can we learn about Jericho? Well, Jericho was one of the oldest cities and civilizations. Um, it can actually be traced back to almost 9,000 B.C. And it actually was one of the greatest challenges that Joshua and the people were going to um, have trying to go into the promised land. If the Israelites could take Jericho, they could divide the land of Canaan, and they would be all good. So think about the layout of Virginia. You, it's almost like if you're going from Lynchburg to Bristol. Um, you can start at Bristol, and then the enemies will start gathering there, and they might outnumber you. But if you took Lynchburg, then you would divide the enemies to the west from the east, and the enemies on the east and those from the north. Also with Jericho, Jericho was well fortified. It was estimated that it had eight to nine acres of size, but, only, but it had two sets of protective walls around it. The city itself was built on a, uh, on a mound with a wall that was 20 feet high and, and, and as thick as well. Then at the bottom of the bank, Another wall had been built for added protection. So from ground level up, the top wall might have been as eight to ten stories high. And so they also had vast amounts of grain. And so normally an enemy to attack a city like Jericho would build a siege ramp so they could march over the walls. Therefore, they had to be, you know, prepared almost up to a year to try to take a city in this type of way. So Jericho was prepared for siege. Um, they also had these different harvests that came in as well, so they were prepared with food, with water. They had everything they need in case they were to go on an attack. But it says in verse 2, Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with the king and his fighting men. Jericho had been existing for thousands of years, and not by accident. They had never lost a battle. Not one, up until this point. And so... They're like, okay, another enemy's coming. We should be good to go. But at this point, though, they actually were in fear because they understood who the Israelites were and how God had worked powerful miracles with them and actually exited them out of Egypt. So now it's like, okay, for the Israelites, okay, how are we going to take this city? Because the normal way from a strategic battle point is it's going to take weeks or months to prepare to get into the city and actually over, over, or overtake it down. But Joshua and them had a lot of temptation here. Because basically the population of Jericho was probably one to 2,000 people. That's it. You haven't been following the Israelites, it's about 2 million of them. So, and they had 600,000 soldiers. So it's like, okay, we got 600,000 men. We could easily take this city. Even if it takes a while or whatever we need to do, we can build them up. So they pretty much outnumbered Joshua, I mean Jericho. But that wasn't the battle that they really were facing. It wasn't the outside battle. It was the inside battle. Because were they going to trust God and what Joshua commanded them to do? So that brings us to what, is God, what was God's plan? March around the city in silence for six days. And on the seventh day, march, march around it seven times and shout. Basically, we have the, they had to put their total dependence on God. So... Many of us grew up with the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, right? And the walls came tumbling down. 
But honestly, Joshua didn't do anything. Joshua led the people, and he told them what God's commands were, and they were obedient to God's commands, but Joshua himself didn't really do anything. God was the one who brought the walls down. Hebrews 11 verse 30 says this, By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. Faith brought down the walls of Jericho. So once the walls come down, they run straight in, and they're taking the spoils. The whole city collapsed except for the house where Rahab and her family actually lived in, which was amazing in itself because Rahab played a great role in letting the spies know what what Jericho was all about, and sure, her place was the only one to actually do this. Now, I want you guys to think about this. Their military strategy for the first six days was, not, was just to walk around once and be silent. You have 600,000 people, and they're all silent for six straight days. How hard would it have been just to say, hey, man, when are we going to end? Can we get something to drink, something to eat? Just basic stuff. But for six days, they didn't say anything. You got priests with the rams and the trumpets ready to, ready to sound. But they were obedient to what Joshua gave God, got, got from God. So they understood just because of how big Jericho was and the, and the walls, man, we can't do this on our own. We've got to be really obedient. For us ourselves, if we're going to overcome obstacles and tests in our, in our lives, we've got to be obedient to God. This is what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 22 and 23. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is in iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from becoming king. Samuel says this to Saul when Saul followed God's instructions, but he wasn't completely obedient. Which leaves the question, how does that work with us? Because too often what happens is we want immediate solutions to the things that's going on in our life. We don't want to wait on God. We don't want to trust him. We say, you know what? This looks good to me. I'm going to do that. So we can trust in our bank accounts. We can trust in our health. We can trust in our talent, our education, our community, even the abilities that God's given us. But we don't want to trust in God alone. And that example could be thinking about, you think about Nahum, when Nahum had leprosy in 2 Kings. And they said, hey, I mean, you want to be healed? He's like, yeah, I want to be healed. Okay. Dip yourself seven times in the Jordan River and you'll be healed. He said, why do I got to get healed in the Jordan River? There's a whole bunch of other rivers that are great. Jordan, the Jordan River was the dirtiest river, just to let you guys know. So for him to say, hey, man, I'm the commander of this army. I'm doing all these things. Just, I can go to any river to get healed. It's like, no, go into the Jordan seven times if you really want to be healed. A lot of times we want to put barriers on what God wants to do in our lives because we feel like this is what is best. This is what we want to do. But we have to really trust God and listen to what he's saying. Now, just, in Jer- just like in Jericho, there's been a lot of walls that we've seen and barriers that have been broken in America. You know, there's been racial barriers. Um, I'm a big sports fan. So there's been a lot of barriers broken lately with women having opportunities to be coaches in, um, in, in professional sports. So you had Jen Welter, who's the first NFL female assistant coach. You also had Sarah Thomas, who's the first NFL football female referee. Then you have Becky Hammond and Nancy Lieberman. They're actually going to be the first assistant female coaches in the NBA. Now, if all you guys have played these different sports, most of these sports are male-dominated sports. So for these women to be coaches in a male-dominated sport, but also to, be, to excel and be great at it, really just sees how, war, how barriers have been broken. Just like we read about the walls of Jericho, there are walls and there's barriers that God wants to break in our own hearts. But we gotta be we gotta submit to him and be faithful towards him. We've got to fully surrender to God and his word. Joshua did that, 
And that's how he was able to pass on the plan of what God was going to do to take Jericho to his people. But they had to be complete, completely obedient and faithful too to make sure it came to pass. So I think about the situation from my own, from my own self, and I'm thinking, okay, what are some bears that I got to bring? So me and Tiffany had a situation this week. We're talking, about, talking through some stuff. And basically, it ended up being a, a bad argument. And on my part, I was in sin. And so I pretty much, pretty much was like, you know what? I don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm just going to go to bed. I'm going to bed mad. I'm not going to get reconciled at all. And I deliberately did that. But even when as I was trying to go to sleep, I was, I was convicted knowing I need to get reconciled. You know, I need to be humble here. So the next morning I had the opportunity to say, Tiffany, I'm sorry about the situation we had last night. It was definitely my fault. And I just, you know, I just apologize for what happened. So one of the things that God has really been showing me this week is that my wall, as you might say, is pride. My question for you guys today is this. What is your Jericho? What wall exists in your life right now that you want to change? Maybe it's an unhappy marriage. Maybe it's guilt over past sin. Maybe a lack of education, a lack of motivation, a lack of confidence, maybe a lack of money. Could it be drugs? Could it be comfort? Could it be a relationship? Bitterness? Or is it forgiving someone? Maybe it's criticalness. Or maybe it's like, man, I don't have any hope. I feel hopeless. When it comes to Jericho, guys, and the Jericho in our own lives, we have two things that we can do. We either can flee or we can face it. If you flee, there's only one place you can go back to, the wilderness. Now, we saw the history of the Israelites. They were in the, Isla, they were in the, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. I don't think we want to go back there. So the only way we can actually go after this is we got to face the Jerichos in our life, but we got to do it God's way. Because you can't get past it. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross. There's nothing that you've done that can't be forgiven. But it's all about how you look at it. Fear is looking at God through your problems. But faith is looking at your problems through God. So which way are you going to look? Fear or faith? What I love about our church is that God has been doing great things in the last few months. Just about the illustrations of faith. I think about Dave and Linda Yaris. I think about the example that they set for us when we actually got to share, uh, serve at the uh, Marine Corps Half Marathon, and we got to pass out packets. We had to pass out T-shirts to all the runners. We were talking about 10,000 to 15,000 runners from across the country who were coming to, to run this marathon. And they, the, 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 the organizers of, them, of the uh, event was so amazing, so impactful, like, we want you guys to serve every year. But that was all because of Dave and Linda really allowing us to be able to say, hey, this is the need. This is how we can meet it as a church. And it was so exciting to really see even all the people in our church who actually ran in the marathon. They had this run group that went every Saturday, and they made it happen. And they got it done. And they all finished. And it was amazing to really see how God worked there. The other thing is, even after we had that service, we had our first service in Fredericksburg at the Hospitality House. So even after everybody's ran and all that type of stuff, you know what? We still got to hear God's word. We still got to be with the fellowship. Let's get it done. So even all those runners and their families were there. They're like, you know what? We're going to hear God's word. We're going to take communion. We're going to get it done. It was amazing to see just the faith of the disciples. The teen internship. As you guys know, normally when we have interns, it's two interns. But God blessed us to have 15 this year. And just the impact and just the love that you guys showed them, they saw it. They said, man, Potomac Valley, man, you guys are a family church, man. We love everything you guys did for us, the serving, the meals. They always mention the meals. And, but it was just amazing, the impact. And I want to thank, personally, our board for saying, you know what? We're going to stretch out by faith, and we're going to see what God works, and we're going to see the impact that the teens had. Um, this summer by just stretching out our faith and see what God does. So I wanted to just give a hand clap for our board. 
and just their faith to do that. And, I mean, these guys, these devos, they had church services, they served the poor, they volunteered at races. They got, we had a chance to go to the White House, the FBI tour, and the White House tour was set up by Will and another brother from Antonio Board with the Community uh, Fellowship uh, Service Fellows. And our sister Christina Oliveris actually hooked us up with going to the FBI tour. It was just amazing to see what the teens um, did and what they learned. We went to teen camp. People were impacted. We had three people get baptized, Rachel, James, and Cameron. I mean, teens are studying the Bible. It's just awesome to see what God does. But all that happened because of faith. To do stuff that we've never done, we got to live on faith. And that's why that stuff happened. Then, of course, Eric Francis and that popcorn. The manna from heaven. The popcorn and the tin and the pallets of, and clothes. The God, you know, blessed him to be able to get from his job to be able for us to do that. And then you, you, we got to talk about the yard sale. We had two. They both went great. But that last yard sale, pouring down raining. And we made $3,000 plus selling popcorn, clothes, and lemonade. Amen. And also the Zoomathon that Linda put on as well. So everybody was working out too. S serving and getting physically fit. God bless us, guys. Even with the special contribution. As a church, we've always given at least $50,000. We're at 70, almost $72,000. That's because you got to stretch your faith. You sacrifice before God. That's what faith looks like. We're already doing it. It's just we just got to keep moving forward. Then John Hewitt and just, just his heart and his service with helping us to build this ramp for this couple. Also Peyton the roof during the internship. And then the, uh, us, the Hewitts, and the Hines had an opportunity last night to be at this program called the, the uh, Mary Shelter. And basically what they do for the Mary Shelter, they take in women who... Um, had different situations with their children and even sometimes even considered abortions, but they housed them to make sure they had the clothing, the education, and the food and everything that they need. And what they do is they have one fundraiser every year to get all the money they need for the year to make sure they have everything to take care of, of these needs. But it was just amazing to see how God even worked in those situations. And we were sitting at Fredericksburg Expo Center. And we're sitting in there and we're like, this is awesome. I'm thinking, what if we had church service here and packed it out, all of us together? Or maybe we had our own Hope Worldwide event, and we had people from all, all along the globe coming to see what God was doing here. Just a vision in that, and I appreciate that you is just really and just investing in us and really saying, you know what, can, can you guys help us and really see what God is doing and working? And so... Even in Fredericksburg, we're excited, man. We're about to have our own midweek services soon, starting in the fall. We're going to start having a service once a month, ne uh, once a month next year on, um, on, our, on our own. And I'm excited to see what God's going to do. But here's the thing, guys. We've got to take the city. Woodbridge, we've got to take the city. Stafford, we've got to take the city. Fredericksburg, we're taking the city. King George, Garland, we're taking the city. But here's the question. How are we going to take the cities? That's right, Thomas. We're doing what the Lord says. Turn to Acts 2, chapter 2, verse 36. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. This is how we're going to take the city. And it reads, therefore, let all ears will be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many others, 
many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to that number that day. That's how we're going to take the city, guys. We're going to call people to repent. We're going to call people to make Jesus Lord. I'm going to call them to get baptized for the forgiveness of their sins so they can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the way we take the city. When these people heard, came in Acts 2, they weren't thinking about the message that God was going to have for them that day. But once they saw the cross and what they knew they put Jesus on the cross for, they're like, you know what? Hey, brothers, what should we do? This is what you do. This is how you take the city, guys. There's no other way. We're going to love people. We're going to serve. We're going to give. But this ultimately is how we take the city. So my charge for you is this. Maybe you've been visiting. You've been coming. And you're like, you know what? I mean, I got, some, I got a Jericho in my life. I got Jerichos in my life. I want to change. Ask the person who, who brought you out to study the Bible with you and give you specific scriptures on those, on that, on those Jerichos in your life. And you... Be faithful and obedient to what God's word is. Maybe as a disciple, you're like, you know what? I got Jericho's too, man. I need some walls that I got to break down. Well, get with the person who's been helping you spiritually and say, look, I need some scriptures on this Jericho that's, rest, that's, it's, that's in my heart. And then you be faithful and you be obedient to God's word and you see how he works. Again, that tight, that tight rope walk, walker, He's like, you know what? I'm, I'm doing all these miracles, doing all these great things. But the challenge wasn't until he challenged the promoter and said, you know what? I know you believe what I can do, but I'm going to see by your actions, will you get in this wheelbarrow as I do it blindfolded? So the, the, the context, guys, is this. You can believe, but your actions have to match it. You got to get in the wheelbarrow. You got to get out of side of your comfort zone to make it happen. So... Who's willing to get in the wheelbarrow? Who's ready to go take the city for God? Because we're about to go and take the city. To God be the glory.